Welcome back to Hardware Unbox for part two of the March 2023 Q&A series. Part Good one job. is... <laughs> do I often get it wrong these days? I think I, I get it right most of the time. Anyway, it's March. It is 2023. It is a Q&A. Part one is on the channel already, so go back and watch that for some more questions and answers from us. But yeah, let's get to the second part. But before we do... Today's sponsor spot is brought to you by Thermal Grizzly and their new 12th gen CPU contact frame by DeBauer. It's well known that the integrated loading mechanism or ILM of the LJ1700 sockets bends 12th gen CPUs, leading to an uneven contact surface that reduces cooling performance. Solving this issue, the contact frame replaces the ILM, allowing for a much more even contact with the CPU's IHS and the base of your cooler, which in turn reduces operating temperatures. Installation's quick and easy, and thanks to the use of anodized aluminium, the contact frame is non-conductive. And then, for those of you who wish to further maximize contact, Thermal Grizzly now offers an optional lapping tool, so for more information, please check the link in the video description. Based on your videos on the 5800X 3D and the recent slash upcoming 3D vCache parts on AM5, it seems the boosts gained from the extra cache are less than Ryzen's first try at added cache. Is this due to te you know, technological limitations on AMD's part, or is it more reflective of the base power of the CPUs growing? Or is it that games have not made a generational increase in hardware demands in some time? I don't know if I'll answer that question directly because we haven't got the 7800 X 3D yet, uh, or at least we haven't got reviews of it. So there may be, uh, it may behave a little bit differently than what we thought. I wouldn't have expected so, but it is hard to comment without having, you know, the 5800X 3D replacement part. But I, I know I'm just saying, generally uh, speaking, the performance gains haven't been as big, but it depends on what you're looking at. I think for some of the games like Factorio, they did scale pretty well in line, and that's probably a really good benchmark for looking at cache performance. So if you do look at that, which is a good example, then you could just say that the scaling was similar. So why we haven't seen that with games could be a whole host of reasons, really. Uh, again, the base speed of the CPUs being faster to begin with. But yeah, I think I think the performance uplift probably a year from now, it'll be similar to what we see with the 5800X 3D. But again, we need the 7800X mm. 3D. We need to test that properly and see how that scales relative to the non-3D vCache part. And then we'll have a better idea of where they, they sit. There's been some pretty significant upgrades to the other aspects of the CPU that can help as well, like yep. the move from DDR4 to DDR5 memory. Mm -hmm. I think the L2 cache as well has doubled between Zen 3 and Zen 4. Mm -hmm. So that sort of faster, closer level cache, there's more of it. So yep. that's going to improve game performance as well. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I hope we'd see over time that the performance, well, you wouldn't want to see the existing Zen 4 parts get slower, but you know what I mean, like the, yes, the gap. the, 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 the gap scaling game, improve yeah, in yeah. favour of the three, which is basically for all those reasons yeah. why I was suggesting that in a year or two from now, because you've got to remember that although what you're commenting on probably was initial benchmark data, but the 5800X 3D, as we got newer games, seemed to become more and more impressive relative to yep. the non-3D cache part, and I certainly expect that we will see that again with the Zen 4 parts. But yep. we'll review... Well, really, I haven't... I, I went on holidays just before the reviews went live, and I haven't done any extensive testing yet other than the day one review, which I don't really consider to be that extensive because time crunch and all that. Once we have a 30-plus game benchmark comparing these CPUs, and I think we'll have a pretty good idea of, of scaling and all that sort of stuff, and that's something I hope to do shortly after the 7800X 3D review. So make sure yep. you, you stay tuned for that one because there'll be plenty of... 3D vCache goodness coming up on the channel uh, probably in a couple of weeks from now. Okay, after having asked your community how often or at least how much of an upgrade a GPU has to be in order to rationalize the expense, did your findings fall in line with your expectations? Hmm. I don't know, I don't know if I really have expectations for that sort of stuff. Um, I'm always just like, I'm wondering, so I'll ask. But I guess the expectation is similar like you know we're pretty reasonable and realistic with any expectations we would have so for example we're not expecting that you guys upgrade every single year or you know a 10 percent performance gain at the same price point will entice you to upgrade at any point in time it's just not worth it so yeah i, I don't think we're ever shocked by the results it's kind of like yeah that's pretty well ballpark where i was expecting those things to to line up 
what we have seen is, which I highlighted in, I think it was the 7900 XT versus 6800 XT 50 game benchmark, was that in 2019, I think the majority of you were around a 50% performance uplift, and then the second highest bracket was 60, and then it went 40 and staggered down from there. Whereas now it's like you guys are very much wanting 60% or more, probably more than that based on the comments I was reading. Uh, and you know, 10%, 20%, 30%, 40% saw almost no votes, uh, 50% saw a little bit, but it was overwhelmingly 60% or more, which um, does suggest to me that it's more of you are going for the more because you are paying more. Like, like I said, the 7900 XT, it's about twice as expensive as the 5700 XT, and it's only twice as fast. So twice as fast seems really good, but then it's twice as expensive. So same cost per frame. Yeah. Of course, you are getting stuff like half decent ray tracing performance, whereas the 5700 XT had no ray tracing performance. Uh, that's about it, right? And obviously more VRAM. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was interesting to sort of see that, you know, I had always, my thinking was that the current strategy of trying to push people up in price hasn't been super successful it has been successful to some extent but it hasn't been as hasn't worked as well as i think the companies would have hoped especially for this generation where sales have been fairly weak and i think the poll is kind of one way of sort of seeing that play out where yes gpus are more expensive now but clearly consumer expectations have gone up too so it's not where NVIDIA and AMD have just broken people where they still want 50% more performance, but now they're perfectly fine paying exorbitantly higher prices. As prices have gone up, people's expectations have gone up, which kind of is working against the price increases, which is what you'd expect and hope to happen. You'd hope that if companies are pushing up their prices, that people would be wanting more. If people are not wanting more and they're just tolerating the higher prices, then that's bad for the market because that's just validating what they're doing and mm. whereas if people are going what you you know you're fine to raise prices but you're not delivering me the performance that I'm I'm wanting you know I'm, if you, I'm having to pay more I'm wanting more than 50% I want 70% I want 80% which I think is perfectly valid and that's that seems to be what the poll uh, was showing which I think is interesting because there's you know I guess there's been sort of maybe this perception that people are just accepting what's going on at the moment but it it feels like among the community, there are still those people, especially the mid-range buyers, not so much people buying 4090s who can afford to pay whatever price is, is put up there. But very much in the mid-range, there has been this sort of angst about, you know, I buy GPUs at $300 mm. and I've been getting absolutely nothing for many, many years. And so now if I'm wanting to, if I need to spend more money, I want more. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a perfectly valid point to to take right like it's yeah perfectly acceptable right it make it makes perfect sense yeah it comes back to what we we're talking about earlier um you know whether this is a sort of a long-term strategy or a really long-term strategy where they're just trying to correct pricing of the past and make it a you know a, the, the 700 to 800 dollar us mid-range the norm or if it's sort of this like almost TikTok type strategy where it's like, okay, so we release one generation that offers a really nice performance bump and value bump in terms of cost per frame. So it's a mm -hmm. really exciting generation. Then we sort of refresh that with garbage. Then we release the next generation, which we have to sort of leverage some kind of unique feature to sell that generation. And then the next generation is exciting again in terms of cost per frame and the cycle repeats. Whereas it's not every single generation leaps things forward like it was. Mm -hmm. And you know, that can be because it's becoming increasingly difficult to get those gains and make those advancements. So they're having to sort of you know, milk it over a longer period of time. I'm not sure. I, I guess time will tell yeah. what the strategy is there, whether they're just trying to you know, get everyone used to the high prices. And when we get three generations away from now, we're not having these conversations to death over and over and over again. It's just like, hey, the thing's $800, buy it or don't. Like... Yeah, to... I mean, it's been complicated over the last decade by some yep. various different factors. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was looking just recently for a, the GPU pricing update videos. I don't think I put this data in, in the video or anything because it wasn't super interesting, but I was just looking at, you know, where have the tiers over time been, you know, what's been like the, the ADTI, what sort of performance mm -hmm. differences that given to the previous gen products and stuff. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there has been some clear generations where NVIDIA has not done very well there. I think, mm -hmm. that, as we've talked about, the, the generations are quite obvious, like Turing. But some of those have coincided with various different other factors, like cryptocurrency mining. There's been 
two clear periods where that has influenced GPU pricing, where mm -hmm. GPUs have been unavailable for six months to longer. There, there's one shorter period many years ago, and there was obviously the more recent one. Those do affect buying decisions from people and affect pricing and all sorts of things. And it does seem to take some time for things to sort of correct back. Mm -hmm. I think with Ampy, for example, that was a clear correction from Turing not selling very well and underperforming in terms of NVIDIA's, you know, you can look at their financial reports from that generation and, you know, it didn't sell as well as the previous generation in Pascal. So they come out the next generation and they do a bit of a correction there. So I guess these things ebb and flow. You s then you see this generation, Ampere sold super well. So what do they do? They correct it back the other way. So, and again, you know, there's just many different factors that go into these things. <laughs> so yeah, that's where we're at at the moment. Um, We'll have to wait and see what happens throughout the rest of the lineup because, as I said, we're sort of still midway through. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you think that in a slow slash recession market like we have today, it would make more sense for NVIDIA and AMD to try to sell people future-proofed products with excess VRAM to try to encourage them to spend their money anyway? Then when the market is hot, you can just lean on the fact that people want to spend their money, so they will just buy things without needing an extra push. Do you think this logic could somehow be applied to things like CPU, motherboard, RAM as well? Well, it would certainly help incentivize people to spend money if they think they're getting a better deal. But yeah. I think that goes against the objective that they're trying to achieve, which um, I've spoke of before, that I think they're trying to condition gamers into getting less while paying more and then make, sort of normalize that trend so that sort of that would go yep. against what they're trying to achieve there. So I don't think well, well, I think that would be a good idea to sell, I agree with you, to more to sell more product. Do not believe that's a strategy they want to go with. I think they're quite happy with taking a bit of a hit now, slowing the market down and getting people used to spending way more. So rather than um high high volume, low margins, they want to sort of go lower volume, higher margins. Is it seems to yep. be the way they want to go, and that would that would certainly set them up better for perhaps they are uh, predicting when they'll make bank again is another sort of cryptocurrency type boom. Um, that would make sense, right? That strategy, setting yourself up yep. for that if they, if they believe that's on the cards again. I mean, it makes sense and you'd look like a genius future guru predictor man if you managed to get something like that right. I think what's more likely to happen is that GPU sales do this and then their investor day happens and they're like, oh, we made no money on GPUs. And their investors are like, uh, what? What are you doing? So that's definitely the short term <laughs> result of that. Uh, yeah, I imagine that, and again, I, I get a lot of the frustration with the GPU market being really bad at the moment. I think though, we are still in the middle of a GPU rollout. So a lot of the reactions that people are having are based on an incomplete product stack. So we've only got the, you know, what I would class as high-end products at the moment. Um, the roller has been slow. Though. The roller has been very slow, but you know, AMD seems to be fumbling around doing their various weird things, and Nvidia has just no incentive to release products because they're the market leader. So, you know, and again, like a lot of the ramifications of people not buying these products, they're yet to play out because the quarter's still in play, and the financial results come down the track, and those sorts of things. So, you know, I think. While I get what you're saying is like, I think that's a valid strategy in that they would try and reset people and incentivize and hope that there's a future where demand's really high again and people will start buying. But I don't think it'll work. And I think there will have to be some sort of reaction um, mm -hmm. in the well, near I future. I hope so. I hope so. I don't yeah. know whether it'll work or not, but that certainly seems to be what they're planning on doing. The it other... seems like they're trying to do it. I just yeah. don't think it'll work. Yeah, well, I would agree with that. I um, think it's not working right the, now. The other side of it is the planned obsolescence. So yeah, uh, they don't want to create another sort of, well, everyone refers to it as the GTX 1080 Ti situation, another yeah, where Pascal flagship, <laughs> where it's too good. So, you, you know, something like a, even, you know, the RTX 3080, um, 3070 had those cards had like, you know, 16, 20 gigs of VRAM. They'd still be absolute weapons today. And if you had an RTX 3080 with 20 gigs of VRAM, which was rumored and was actually going to happen, and they pulled back on that one, yep. I saw all the marketing materials and everything. The AIBs were ready to push that product out, and it got cancelled last minute. That product would be very good today, like very usable, very good. You'd be playing games like Hogwarts Legacy with ray tracing enabled at 1440p with ultra, ultra everything, and it'd be 60 FPS plus, so it'd be very playable. But 
Instead, parts like the 3070, they just fall on a huge heap. They're basically unusable because they only have 8 gigs of VRAM. Yeah, I mean, I think AMD is certainly targeting that as one area where they see competitiveness and mm-hmm. competition, where they can offer more VRAM than the competition. It just means people who buy AMD GPUs don't buy new ones. <laughs> but, but you know, the, this is where it's, if AMD was more competitive, not just VRAM, they're more competitive in features sure, and ray tracing and performance and stuff, then they would sell more and then NVIDIA would be like, hey, our GPU's not selling because we don't have enough VRAM or whatever the, the mm-hmm. lacking feature-wise is. Yep. So... That's where you'd hope the market gets to. Unfortunately, AMD is not in the position where that's really significant seller for them. Mm-hmm. I think you know it's one of those cases where you don't see the benefit of having more VRAM until many years after the purchase. So it's very hard. And you know, I think you copped a bit of criticism for your take on like 6800 versus 3070 at the time, where mm-hmm. you mentioned it was a selling point, but a lot of people said that's not going to be too much of an issue. Seems like maybe these days that it is. It, yeah, it, an it, issue. De- it depends on where you are as well, generational wise. Like, there's yeah. there'll, be, there'll be some generations. Like, if we had gone back two or three generations before that, where eight gigabytes of VRAM would have been fine for the foreseeable. Yeah, but it was for, like you bought a 1080 Ti, eight yeah. gigabytes, whoa, heaps for yeah. for the last. Well, 1080, card. 1080 at least. Yeah, yeah, 1080 Ti had even more. So eleven apparently. <laughs> but yes, I'm just saying. So yeah, I mean. Yeah, I think that probably covers that one pretty well. I think it's there's more going on than... I, yeah, I don't think they want to give you a lot of VRAM at the moment for various reasons. So. Yes. You, you don't, no competition, you don't unfortunately. Yeah. Just wondering if you think the 4050 will be released in 2023 as we are basically four months in. Also, with the price hikes that have been happening for 4,000, do you think there will be any RTX, say, 4030 or 4040 or maybe GTX cards uh, below 4050, as it could be anywhere from 300 to $450, which is damn expensive for entry level. <laughs> yeah, welcome to the new entry level, yeah. I guess. Uh, so do I think a 4050 will be released this year? Yes, I think so. Probably, maybe, yeah. could be. I, I, have we ever heard any rumors or leaks about that particular product well the die exists mm-hmm. it's currently being manufactured and it is used for laptops mm-hmm. so there's it's not like they're having to make the die sure. out of nowhere it does exist mm-hmm. um yeah i think the we've seen the release cycle for mid-range cars get longer and longer as companies are trying their absolute hardest to get people to buy products like the rtx 4080 while they sit on shelves and that yeah, or, strategy not works or so. um, buy up existing inventory of yeah exactly inventory of previous generation products that's so okay let's say yeah okay it's going to arrive uh and yeah it's going to be expensive like it's going to be not a compelling product but that's the way things are headed like i mean i can't see the rtx 4060 being a great product to be perfectly honest no um purely because it's probably going to have eight gigabytes of vram and you know we've seen eight gig of vram will be four hundred dollars it'll be mediocre giving you 10% 10% more performance than the previous generation or something. And yep. yeah, so, yeah, that's very, mid-range very, now. Yeah. And again, this it's lovely to blame NVIDIA for, you know, making crappy entry-level cards, but there's no competition. Yeah, where's AMD? No com- and like part of the issue with AMD's GPUs again last generation was like, again, your the, the RX 6600 came out and it ended up being a very compelling product. It is great value if you're buying in the sort of $200 to $300 range. But at the time when it came out, it was terribly overpriced and was not very good. And this is an, another... 700 XT. Another blunder from AMD of setting the expectations wrong so that everyone gets this idea of like, yeah, okay, okay, you know, you, you've got the consumer sitting there. They're wanting to see what the latest, you know, next-gen entry-level cards are doing. And they're like, oh, I'm super excited. They watch the review. It's like, oh, that's pretty mediocre. And they're just like, all right, I'll forget that. Mm. In my mind, I'm not going to look at that in the future. Don't care. It's out of my mind now. All the reviews are mediocre. Don't care. And they, you know, they buy something else or don't look at the price in the future because the expectation's been set. Mm. It's been set as being bad, and it takes a lot to reverse that. So if we want to see these products like the 4050 not being a terrible $350 GPU offering you nothing, AMD needs to come out and make their card not terribly priced yeah, at launch. and the worst part is as well, it's so frustrating. It's not that they're doing it. Six months down the track, twelve months down the track, like it's like straight away. <laughs> well, I think the RX sixty six hundred. Admittedly, there was the whole cryptocurrency thing, which it's hard to blame mm. Nvidia for that. But that it was as soon as that was over, it was slashed. It, yeah, months. The thirty fifty is still not really at two hundred and fifty dollars. That's right. 
So, so it just shows yeah, their power there. That's right. So, but there's no cryptocurrency boom to sort of use as the scapegoat there. Why Why was the 1700 XT released at 900? <laughs> Such an imbalance. Oh my God. Why was that ever a thing? It should have never been a thing. Um, yeah, it's, it's, so, no, it's no good. And it's like, yeah, okay, over time, AMD fixes these things, they lower prices. And I know you said in a video recently that they should have official price cuts, which, yep. which I agree with. Mm hmm. Um, or was that a, a podcast? Can't remember. You said it recently. I said some, it. Some for, some, it's a thing some I form, said. But, you know, the, marketing is clearly very important with these products. And NVIDIA does a very good job of this. They, they're all over it, mm -hmm. all over the marketing. They've got great marketing. And AMD seems to, you know, there's obvious ways where they could improve their market share. And it just seems like, you know, I don't know whether you'd agree with this, but it almost seems like they just don't care. But they, they genuinely don't care about having good GPU market share? Well, I mean, I don't know what other explanation there is for that. It's yeah. almost like they're... Whenever they've got an opportunity to do something, it, it seems, again, we have limited insight. I'm sure the people running the company <laughs> have a better understanding yeah. of the industry than we do, you would hope. Yeah. But you just they just seem to do the opposite of what they should be doing. And then when it's all played out, you think, okay, and you've got to... You can the dust settles and you can analyze it, but you're like, yeah, I still don't understand why they did what they did. Yeah. So, a bit puzzling there, but yeah, they've obviously had an opportunity here, regardless of really where mm -hmm. the performance came out, to give Nvidia a good kick and win back yeah. some market share. And they're like, nah. Like, yeah, things like 6500 XT comes out for $200 being just a terrible product. It's like, they, they just shoot themselves in the foot with things like that. It's mm. like maybe just don't release that product or make it cheaper or something. You know, yeah, I, I would I would say that, you know, it's going to be much more difficult to get a good value $200 GPU like the RX 580 GTX 1060 mm. era. I think those days are pretty much gone. Mm -hmm. But then you think about the 20 series was only a few years ago and they released, NVIDIA released the GTX 16 series with, yeah, the 1650 wasn't, amazing but it was 150 dollars 1650 super was a lot better so yeah they at least had something for 150 dollars mm. the last two generations have not had a card even close to that price mm. um with the rtx 3050 being effectively 300 dollars plus throughout its entire lifespan so there's clearly an opportunity here to make some sort of it doesn't have to be a great product but it just at least has to be good or average at around 200 dollars offering yeah, admittedly, not. it won't be very impressive in terms of performance. It won't offer heaps of VRAM, but it can't make obvious mistakes like having no PCIe bus <laughs> and having two display connectors. And no hardware encoding. No hardware encoding. You know, it's those obvious things like, yeah, th these are just areas that AMD could, you know, provide competition. Intel, I think, with a, if Intel does come around to having a, a next generation, I think their drivers will hopefully have improved to the point where they can start offering much better experiences because you'd hope that the day one reviews of a future Intel Arc GPU wouldn't be talking about, hey, you know, half the games don't work and no. performance in CS goes horrible and the drivers crash. It'll be more, let's let's genuinely just look at performance. Let's see right. how competitive it is. Yep. And maybe they have an angle there. So it all comes down to competition. And with something like the 4050, we need a lot of it. Mm. All right, Tim. Is it safe to run your GPU at full power all the time without frame limiters like VSync, game engine limiters, that sort of stuff, especially when the game doesn't require that level of performance? Um, I don't think that, I don't think the level of performance the game necessarily requires means that it's safe or, or not. Uh, typically speaking, yeah, running your GPU at full power for 24 seven or however long it is that you game is perfectly fine. Uh, I know, you know, you can get excessive coil, coil wine if you go to, say, a menu or whatever with a, without a frame limiter and it starts squealing. See, so it hit 2,000 FPS. You're like, oh, that's why. Yes, I'm not sure on that. Uh, I know there's been controversy before with games apparently killing graphics cards. I'm not sure what evidence there is to support that. I wouldn't have... I don't... Usually with those things, like one or two examples of anecdotal evidence, so it's really yeah. hard to make a call. I w yeah, I personally wouldn't have thought that was possible, but not a, not an expert on that, and I haven't... I mean, I guess I can't really speak from experience, f personal or otherwise, because I've never left a GPU just grinding away at 1,000, 2,000 FPS, squealing at 
Because basically, when, especially when you talk about things like coil line, which we've discussed on the channel previously, which is a hard thing to pin down because there seems to be external factors that, because I, I very rarely, if ever, run into coil line in my own testing lab, where we have all new power delivery in a newer state and all that, that seems to play a big role there. So basically you can take any one of the graphics cards that I have in here, dozens upon dozens of them, generally the higher end models that are capable of driving a thousand FPS or whatever during a light sort of scene, all of those, whether they're Nvidia, AMD, Gigabyte, Asus, and so on, when you're driving insane frame rates through those cards, all of them will make a high pitched squealing noise varying degrees of it, but I guess that's what some people would consider coil wine. Uh, but yep. pretty much anything is going to do that when driving a thousand plus FPS, even hundreds, you know, four or 500 frames, you can start to hear it. it gets a bit extreme at a thousand plus. I I've never, ever left a car doing, you know, 2000 FPS in a, a menu type scenario for days on end to see what that does. Uh, I don't know is the answer. Yeah, I don't think coil wine is necessarily damaging yeah i don't think it's fatal product. it's just annoying i mean these are all things that would be tested in the labs at the, the you know the engineering side of things for these graphics cards so if they're allowing 5000 fps to be executed on the card then sure it can do that, it that's fine yep. um yeah i don't think there's been any evidence of like maxing out cards making them die uh, obviously all cards have a lifespan so the amount of hours that you put in is going to shorten its lifespan things like higher temperatures will generally shorten the lifespan but these things could be only playing out after, well after the card is, you know, you might be shortening the lifespan from 15 years to 12 years, by which time you've well moved on from that product. So, Unless it's an RX 480. <laughs> well, yeah. So, yeah, I think it's not too much of an issue. I think if you want to run your card at maximum performance, that, that's what it's designed to do. They're designed to be run at 100%. Um, if they weren't, then that would be bad and you'd have cards dying all the time because 100% utilization is very much a common use case for cards. Mm -hmm. They are, you know, modern GPUs have load managers and all sorts of things built in so that they don't exceed the clock speeds that they're supposed to or the power limits that they're supposed to. That's all very advanced um, these days. So, yeah, you should just use it and have no concerns, really. If you're not overclocking, you're just using it stock, just go about your normal everyday usage and not worry. And if your graphics card blows up the menu, we're not responsible. Interesting question here. Do you think it's beneficial or detrimental to Ark that Raja Kaduri has left slash been pushed out? It's not like he's had any real successes for quite a while, and I'm not sure Ark was better or worse for him being at the helm. It's quite a critical question of Raja, but... Yeah, I see this stuff all the time. And look, I'll just say that I'm not that interested in individuals that work for these big corporations. Generally, when we critique or you know praise products from the corporations, we're generally praising or critiquing the product and not so much the corporation. Uh, yeah, we don't care whether it's AMD, Nvidia, whoever, it's the product we're interested in. So as for the individuals behind potentially the products or they're involved in the companies or at whatever level, we don't have that much insight. That's not something we're interested in, at least me personally. I don't know yeah. too much about Raj and what he's done and what he hasn't done. And I'm not sure how fair uh, people's for a lack of a better term, analysis has been of him, how accurate they are. Uh, it's impossible I, to know what it like. If if we were sitting here and we had a document that had all of his roles and responsibilities outlined for us, and yeah. then we can judge what's happened versus those things, then then we could make a, a good call on this. Yeah. But if we don't really know, like, like we don't know what the internal politics are like at Intel, like what's happening at, at an executive level above him mm -hmm. and below him, mm -hmm. what what was the team like that he had access to, what was his budget and resources, and what were the sort of goals that Intel set for him. You know, it's it's difficult to, you know, it, it's easy to sit here and say, okay, Intel's first generation wasn't amazing, therefore it's Raj's fault. But it's almost always much more complicated than that. Well, yeah, and it's like if someone else was in that position, would it have been better or worse? We don't know. There's no. We can't do so, A-B testing on executives. No, they, they it seems like argue. people love to hate on him without any real insight into what actually went on there and yeah, yeah how, much, how much any one person is to blame or attribute to successes. And, and the, the interesting thing will be is if, pe if the next generation of ARC GPUs is really successful, people will attribute that to Raja leaving, even though Raja almost certainly had a significant influence on this upcoming generation or at least because as, it takes so long to come out. Or at the very least, as much of an influence as he did on the first generation, yeah, significant exactly. or otherwise. So, so, 
Yeah. Yeah. I th- obviously, there are people in the industry who have very good track records and are highly influential, but that's mm. only usually comes out towards the end of their career where you can look at they're involved with all these influential projects in really key roles and all those projects really successful. You can say, hey, that's a great track record. That person was clearly very good at what they're doing. But in the moment, it's almost impossible to say what's going on. Yeah, and you can just luck that as well. Exactly. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> you can go from one winning project to the next. I yeah. mean, People have definitely done that. And then they're like the, the third or fourth project they get to just really exposes them. You know, that can happen. So. Yeah. Would 3D cache be a good move for Intel to pair with their performance cores? Would there be challenges that AMD was able to avoid? And if Intel managed a 3D cache chip, how would AMD need to respond? Well, I imagine it's certainly technically possible. Um, Would it be as beneficial? Probably not, but that's just a guess, obviously, because we haven't seen it. Uh, Intel seems to do much better with memory, uh, much more efficient memory management than AMD, whether it be accessing DRAM or local sort of cache. Uh, They seem to be able to provide excellent levels of gaming performance with a lot less cache than AMD. So there's clearly something going on there. So if adding even more, uh, but again, like we've seen from Core i5, i7, i9, the, the main influence there on the performance uplifts is the cache capacity increasing rather than the core count increasing. I think I tested that with 10th gen. Yep. I imagine that's still the, the situation with 13th gen. So at what point do we see diminishing returns and that stops scaling? It, it yeah. may be that you do, you do see similar scaling to AMD. Not sure. Um, just because they're able to compete with AMD with a lot less cash doesn't mean they wouldn't still scale with more. Yep. So there's a lot of unknowns there, obviously, with this question because we, we haven't seen it. But... I would say yes, they would they would benefit from it. To what degree, don't know, but it would be of benefit. How would AMD respond? They'd be like, oh, bother, yeah. that sucks for us. <laughs> um, they'd just have to hope that Intel wasn't as competitive on pricing or something like that. But uh, if Intel was able to be competitive on pricing and 3 dv cash offered you know, 20% more performance, AMD would be up that famous creek without a paddle. Yeah, Intel seems to benefit a lot these days from frequency, having very high frequencies on their parts. AMD does too, to some degree, but mm-hmm. you know, we have seen from the Vcash AMD parts that you can't clock that sort of die as high as you can the, the parts without Vcash. Mm-hmm. So if Intel runs into that same sort of problem, is that going to counteract some of the benefits of the extra cash? Especially if, as if you're saying it doesn't maybe it doesn't scale as well as we see on AMD, maybe get a little bit of performance from the extra cache, but then they have to take clock clock speeds back. Does it just negate that? I mean, mm. maybe that's one... Re- I mean, I think the main reason why they haven't developed something like this is it takes a long time to implement features like this, but that could be a factor that's influencing their decision to offer or not offer vCache or something that's like right. that. That's right, it comes with a compromise. And yeah. That's a significant one on their end. Yeah, and Intel may be able to schedule it better because they seem to have got the more mature scheduler with performance cores and e-cores so if they did have that dual design maybe they don't run into some of the issues that amd has with their like 7950x allocating to cash or non-cash cores yeah they don't they don't have the power budget they don't have the thermal yeah. headroom there's That's so right. many limitations of, of course we could be talking about future designs that yeah, aren't yeah, as yeah. limited in that regard but yeah there's trade-offs and it yeah between cost and and the frequency trade-offs it's probably just not worth it for them at least yeah. currently at present what is currently the most hardware demanding game to bench? Please exclude Microsoft Flight Simulator. Not a game, simulator. Uh, are devs focusing more on current consoles and thus less demanding titles? Where is the new Crisis? Well, I'd say Cyberpunk 2077 was probably the mm-hmm. new Crisis, so we've already had that. To some degree, because Cyberpunk still ran well on lower end cards with the settings turned down, was that yeah, was not the well. case for Crisis. <laughs> Crisis yes. ran terribly on low end products at the time. Yeah, uh, and I'll be, I'll just say a controversial opinion, uh-oh. maybe not that controversial, but what Crisis did at the time was silly. Yes, it was very silly. They probably would have, you know, if you get into the tessellation thing. Or, no, or I'm talking. Else? I'm just talking about making a game that doesn't run on current gen cards very well is not a sensible right. play because yep. if you can't, if a if a potential game buyer is looking at their hardware, being like, oh, I'm interested in playing that game, and then it comes out, actually, I can't play that without spending hundreds on hardware. See, they're going to be like, you would think so, but was the game successful? And are we still talking about it all these years later? I don't know whether it was or wasn't successful. I don't know, we'd have to go back and forth. But we're still talking about it. Yeah. There's plenty of other games that were very impressive released at the time 
and I can't recall them off the top of my head right now. If it was I a long time ago, yeah. 2007. If I looked something. them up, I'd be like, oh, yes, of course, that game, because I tested them. Yeah. But it was a long time ago. Uh, it had staying power in the benchmarking community because it yep. was so well, intensive. I, yeah. But I think in terms of gaming, yeah. Yeah, I think it was pretty popular. I think it was success. Well, there was plenty of spin-offs anyway, so yeah. it kind of been a flop. But yeah, I mean, other crisis type games. And what was the sec- what was the second part of the question? Um, are devs focusing too much on consoles and l- and less on demanding titles? Well, I wouldn't. Yeah, you know, Hogwarts Legacy. That's a pretty demanding title. Yeah, they're always focusing on consoles. That's that's been the case for well, a long time now. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I just think that the the whole crisis situation is something that we won't see again, really, because well, did, as I said, yeah, it didn't make sense. Uh, it, didn't make a, a ton of sense and the, the way of today is more games that scale significantly i think this has been an area where pc gaming has improved a lot previously you'd see games you know even when i started you know the initial optimization guide era of hardware unboxed you see a game like assassin's creed odyssey let's say as an example or what was on before that origins those games um where ultra settings versus low settings pretty narrow gap Hmm. And certainly a lot of the scenes you turn down, they, they would have... Yeah, I don't, I don't think that was... The, the question was more, though, forget about scaling and the, the lower end hardware. The, the question was more a game that really pushes cutting edge, you know, technology, the, the greatest of the greatest type stuff. But I think so, that's, what they're do, that's what they're better at doing hmm. now. Whereas previously they did all that weird things where it didn't scale well, the top end didn't look great, yeah, yeah. like Assassin's Creed. Nowadays it's very much about let's scale it way down to a Steam Deck mm-hmm. and also push it way up. And a game like Hogwarts Legacy, you know, you can run that on lower end hardware. You just have to sacrifice sure. some features. Cyberpunk is now Steam Deck certified. So as good as that game looks on your flagship cards, there's the new ray tracing mode that's just about to launch. Again, it scales all the way down. And that's not something we got with Crisis I mean, previously. Games like Fortnite these days look insanely good. Yeah. And have you seen all the new stuff they're doing? That That's going to open up yeah. a, a lot of possibilities for gaming. There's going to be some very cool stuff within that. Well, like obviously the Unreal Engine 5 and iterations of it, but just the stuff they're doing now visually absolutely mind-blowing yeah. impressive and yeah crazy that it's all done in a game that was Fortnite. yeah so there'll, there'll be more of that over the next mm-hmm. few years more graphically demanding games but i don't imagine there'll be games where they come out and they don't run on mid-range hardware i think that those days are over there'll be yep. some form of scaling there well it has to be yeah yeah do you think AMD's 12 core parts have any real relevance to buyers what's the point if you can just spend a hundred dollars more for the 16 core parts Something I've wondered for a while, actually, why the 12 core model is in the market. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's just so they can sell two six core dies, essentially. I guess so. I mean, for production, most people who you know, need cores for their production workloads and stuff, typically speaking, you just buy the highest performing part um, because, again, you know, time is money, sorts of things. The cost of a 7950X is still pretty affordable for workstation workloads. It's certainly not like a four thousand dollar thread ripper part or anything so it's not forced segmentation though no it's not so i don't no. mind it it's like if if they were doing something where they were cutting down a product deliberately to sort of force this the segmenting the market which we have seen in the cpu industry quite heavily then i'd have a bit of a problem with it but it's just like they could offer it or they could not offer it and does it change much like the pricing yeah. structure is going to be much the same so if they were just like, it's not worth offering this product because people aren't going to buy it, so let's not offer it. it yeah. It's just- yeah, yeah, you're right. It's not like it's a bad thing that it exists. It's just that it, it's never seemed like a super compelling product. Yeah, it's like I the guess. 7900X3D seems like a really stupid part to me. Yeah. Uh, but I'm not, I'm not upset that it exists and I'm not like, this part shouldn't exist because it's a scam or something absurd like that. It's if, just... If people are buying it, then there's a, obviously a market from someone for it. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I don't think you should buy it, but it's it's just another option. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. So, we're going to hit pause there for part two. I believe we've got enough questions from you guys. Actually, it's quite some good questions from our Discord and YouTube community. So, there'll probably be a part three on the channel in the next couple of days. So, yeah. You won't have to cry about there not being any more hard run box yeah, questions stop, this month. Stop crying about everything, I thought, guys. Yeah, it usually gets pretty emotional once you get towards the end of the video oh, and you're yeah. like, oh, there's not much more here and now I have to go back to watching other YouTube content or whatever. It's, so. it's a sad way to sign off each month. Yeah, it is pretty sad. So 
end that sadness, park that away, crush that deep down inside you because part three is coming uh, up on the channel soon. So yeah, for everyone else, we've got our Patreon float plane accounts. So if you want to sign up and gain access to things like our Discord community, monthly live streams, BTS videos from time to time, Q and A's, it's probably more stuff I always forget about, but yeah, lots of good things over there to sign up for. So we have links in the description below for that. What else is that? It subscribe to Hardware Unboxed. We haven't said that for a while. I'm just subscribe. laughing how you make a much more, much better engineer than you do therapist. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> it's not really my calling in life. I don't think. <laughs> anyway, let's end this one. I'm your host Tim. I'm your host Steve. See you next time. <laughs>